In chapter 5, verses 16 through 26, Paul discussed in general the basic underlying principle of either uh, following the desires of the flesh and doing the deeds of the flesh versus uh, obeying the Spirit and bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Now, in chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, he gives specific examples of what walking in the Spirit and faith working through love look like. So first, let's take a look at verses 1 through 5, where he talks about bearing one another's burdens. Verse 1, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. Now, um, in verse 1, it contrasts the attitudes of boastfulness and arrogance and envy mentioned in chapter 5, verse 26, and mentions the proper response that Christians should have when others sin, namely to restore such a person in the spirit of gentleness. Now, this flows naturally from the gospel of grace and not works that Paul has been explaining because we know that we're saved only by God's grace. We're all in the same boat as sinners, and we all have the active power of indwelling sin within us. And therefore, none of us uh, should be boastful or arrogant, but we all know that we need each other uh, because, remember, we've been adopted into Christ's family, the body of Christ. And the body is one of the important means of grace that the Spirit uses to conform us to his image and to help keep the entire body uh, on the right path. Now, um, this, unfortunately, can be a big problem in many churches because often church leaderships do not exhibit a spirit of understanding, or a spirit of gentleness at all. Uh, I know of some churches whereby the first resort, rather than the last resort, uh, is to excommunicate people who commit certain sins. For example, a girl gets pregnant out of wedlock, and what happens to her? Excommunicated. I mean, yes, she made a mistake, and she's going to pay for it the rest of her life. But she's also a victim. I mean, she's now got a little child. She needs help. I mean, a church should be like a hospital where people are healed, not like a prison. Uh, I mean, I, we need to examine our attitudes because, as we said earlier, everybody is going to sin. Uh, and do we have really a Christ-like attitude, uh, such, for example, that Jesus exhibited uh, in John 8 with the woman uh, caught in adultery. Uh, so, you know, what Paul is saying here in verse 1 is very important and has great practical effects. Are we manifesting Christ's gentleness, his love, his compassion, his help? Um, are we in our response? Yes, the church's integrity needs to be upheld, but are we exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit uh, in our reaction to people who sinned? Uh, because uh, our ultimate goal in dealing with people should be their restoration, not just punishment. Now, verses 1 and 4 uh, here exhort us basically to look to ourselves so that we won't be tempted. Um, and so... Verse 4, each one must examine his own work. Um, and uh, so, uh, verse 1, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. 
we've stressed again and again, Paul is calling us to a life of self-examination. Um, and uh, in, in, in this, Paul is really kind of reiterating what Jesus said in Matthew 7, where he said, the way you judge is the way you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured out to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eyes, but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? This applies, of course, to all Christians. But it particularly, I think, applies to church leaders. Because everyone's looking at the leader because everyone implicitly knows the leader should be manifesting Jesus Christ. And people in the back of their minds, non-believers, they're thinking, what does real Christianity look like? You should be able to see it in the leader. And if the leader is not manifesting a spirit of gentleness, of compassion, of love, of truth, of speaking the truth in love, but is manifesting a self-centered spirit, a greedy spirit, a vindictive spirit, that person is showing that he does not have the spirit He's probably not born again. And if I saw that in a church leader, that is the last church I would ever want to go to. Um, so again, these things have very practical uh, implications. Now, verse 2 talks about bearing one another's burdens and thereby fulfilling the law of Christ. This also is a logical and natural outgrowth of the gospel since Christ bore our burden our burden of sin that we could never repay. And so now we need to show that we really understand that by bearing other people's burdens. And this also is the logical and natural outgrowth of the nature of the church. Why? Because we've all been adopted into God's family. We are family. We're brothers and sisters. And all families take care of of each other. Um, I mean, when we look at our natural or earthly brothers or sisters and they have problems and burdens, when we look at our children and their problems or our parents, we naturally are moved by compassion and love to help and help bear the burdens of our natural family members. Just remember, our earthly families are only temporary. They will end when we die. The family we have been adopted into Christ's family is eternal. It will last forever. We will be brothers and sisters with each other for all of eternity. So we better start treating our brothers and sisters, our spiritual brothers and sisters, uh, with love, compassion, and bearing their burdens now on earth. We should treat them as real brothers and sisters because they are. Our spiritual family is the real permanent family. Don't ever forget that. And we need to teach our people this. Now, he says here, by doing this, we will uh, fulfill the law of Christ. Now, the law of Christ is named specifically only here and in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 21. But the law of Christ is implicit throughout the New Testament. The law of Christ is the teachings of Jesus and also of the New Testament uh, writers. It contains both general principles and specific principles applications. Um, and so, uh, and of course, uh, love is at the center of the law of Christ. Jesus placed it, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul earlier here said that the entire law is summarized in love your neighbor as yourself. And so, uh, the law of Christ is uh, general principles but specific applications. And now Paul is here, I mean, throughout the New Testament, he, there are lots of specific applications of, of what it means. I mean, early in the book, he said, one of the specific applications is, don't forget the poor and the needy. Well, now he's talking about bearing one another's burdens. Now, the law of Christ is different. I mean, the Old Testament law, just like the Sharia law, just like any law, was an external law. It did not change us internally. It didn't change our hearts and minds. That's where the law of Christ is different because Christ actually comes to live inside of us. And when 
uh, God was prophesying the coming of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 and in Ezekiel 36. He said, I will place my law in your hearts. I will place my spirit inside of you so that you will all know me and you will naturally obey my law, the law of Christ. Um, and so that's why we need to abide in Christ. We need to know him. We need to know his word. Uh, we need to listen to him. We need to follow him and obey him. We need to be in relationship with each other uh, uh, constantly. Um, and it's very interesting. In the last lecture, I talked about the Ten Commandments uh, at the end of the lecture. Uh, but it's, I think, very interesting that in the New Testament, when people faced ethical or moral decisions or problems, they never appealed to the Ten Commandments. Why? Because we're in the New Covenant now. The Old Covenant has been superseded by the New Covenant. The Law of Moses has been superseded by the Law of Christ. So the New Testament writers never looked back to Moses. They always looked to Christ. The standard now for us is not Moses and Mount Sinai, but Christ on Calvary. And so we always need to be asking ourselves, what course of conduct or what behavior is consistent with the gospel? Uh, and as we do that, we will be seeking to be led by the Spirit. We will be listening to the Spirit. And when the Spirit implants thoughts of how we need to act, we will obey the Spirit and thereby we will be growing in Christ and becoming more like him because that's the whole point of our life, according to Romans 8, 29, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, I already mentioned that in these verses, uh, Paul is stressing self-examination. Um, and so, but he talks about not comparing uh, ourselves. Uh, uh, we must examine his own work and then we will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, not in regard to another. In other words, most people compare themselves to others. And you, if you feel superior to others, you boast about how better you are. No, 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 no. We only have to compare, and we only must compare ourselves to Jesus Christ. Because that way, I can bear the burdens of others, knowing that I'm in the same boat as that person, but... Christ is also in me, and I can bear his burdens or her burdens without condescending, without being arrogant, but being in a spirit of compassion and love. Um, and so, as, as Paul said, if we're looking to Christ, um, then, uh, as he said, uh, that we will see that our only reason for boasting, as he says in Galatians 6 verse 14, is to boast in the cross of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 5, when it says, for each one will bear his own load, that is talking about the judgment. You are responsible for what you do in this life. I am responsible for what I do in this life. And I will give, we'll all give an account of our entire lives on the day of judgment. But that is why we're told to bear each other's burdens now. Um, because if we joyfully bear one another's burdens now, then we can look forward to the judgment because we will have been good and faithful servants who will have fulfilled the law of Christ. And, you know, as he says, if you bear one another's burdens, you thereby fulfill the law of Christ. If you fulfill the law of Christ, what do you have to fear in the judgment? Because you fulfilled the law. You see, all of these things work together. You don't have to fear the judgment at all. Walk in the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Your life will change, and you can joyfully look forward to the judgment because, as Jesus said back in John chapter 3, uh, he said in John 3, verse 21, he said, But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. In other words, as we fulfill the law of Christ, as we act uh, in uh, obedience to the Spirit, uh, 
It's God working in us, both to will and to do, and therefore we can look forward to the judgment. Now, in verses 6 through 10, he goes on basically to say, what you sow uh, is what you will reap. So let's do good to everybody now while we can. Verse 6, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are who are of the household of faith. So the principle underlying this whole subsection is whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Um, and this principle is so important that Paul prefaces it with a command, do not be deceived, and also a statement, God is not mocked. Now, this principle is found throughout the Bible uh, because it, it, it's consistent with what God says uh, throughout the Old and New Testaments, where he says he will judge people and nation and repay them according to their deeds or their ways or their works. This principle relates to uh, the fact uh, of the issue underlying this entire epistle, namely that we are saved by grace through faith alone, as opposed to salvation by works. Now, you may be thinking, when God says he's going to judge people according to their works or their deeds, doesn't that talk about salvation by works? No. And the reason is, of course, we can never work our way to heaven, as we've previously discussed. But the fact of the matter is, as Onesimus in Gundu says, Works are an index of the spiritual condition of a person's heart. The judgment is not balancing of good works over bad works. Rather, works are seen as the unmistakable evidence of the loyalty of the heart. They express belief or unbelief, faithfulness or unfaithfulness. The judgment will reveal whether or not people's loyalties have been with God and the Lamb or with God's enemies. You see, God gives us opportunities all the time to demonstrate whether, in fact, we have been born again. And our works show not only other people, but they show us, and they therefore should be encouraging to us as we start following the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, obeying the Spirit, and thereby, as we bear one another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. Now, these principles that he discusses here, are, he, he applies them in three areas. In verse 6, Christian ministry. The one who is taught the word is, uh, is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Um, and that is telling us the church has an obligation to give back materially, in other words, to pay uh, those who are nourishing it spiritually. In other words, the church has an obligation to pay the pastor. Um, Yes, he's been called by God uh, to do the work he or she is doing. But God uses the church. I mean, God does not open up the ceiling or the sky and shower down dollars or shillings or francs on people. No, he uses his people to pay materially uh, when they are being fed spiritually. Now, the Bible doesn't say how much or the basis and so on, obviously it will differ from place to place. Um, but it is important for church leaders and congregations to see themselves in partnership, to have the mind of Christ and to be led and walk by the Spirit. Now, so Paul applies the principle of sowing and reaping, uh, first to Christian ministry, then to Christian holiness. Verse 8 says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So, he earlier discussed in chapter 5 uh, about the desires of the flesh, and that's the same as sowing to the flesh. It's fulfilling the desires of the flesh versus uh, 
walking in the Spirit and being led by the Spirit. What he's saying in all of these verses is that it's either one or the other. You're either sowing to the flesh or you're sowing to the Spirit. Nothing in life is neutral. And again, we need to look at the motive, why we do what we do. Go back to the example of Paul not uh, circumcising Titus, but circumcising Timothy. He was not inconsistent because the circumstances and the motives for either doing it or not doing it were very different. Uh, so we need to be following the Spirit, not being led by an external set of rules that no longer apply. Now, when he talks about uh, sowing to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life. That's pointing out that everything we do in this life has eternal, everlasting consequences. That's why Jesus said, don't store up your treasure on earth, but store it up in heaven. And in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, Paul points out that we store up our treasure in heaven by being generous in good works, by giving our money to help the poor and the needy, to build the gospel, by sharing by doing all of these things, we're not losing our money. We're actually, it's being transferred to an eternal bank account with our name on it that will pay us back interest for the next 10,000 million, billion, trillion, zillion years. We're fools if we just live for ourselves. And then the third example in verses 9 and 10 is Christian service. Um, so he talks about let's not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who are of the household of faith. He's reminding us of the principle of sowing and reaping, and in due course we will reap. That may mean in this uh, life, sometimes it's clear when we've done something good and helped somebody, we will reap benefits in this life. But it is certainly true uh, that we will reap uh, eternally. Um, and, and he points out an important caveat. He says, if we do not grow weary, living a faithful life can be very difficult. We're tempted to fall back. We deal with people who have all kinds of problems and issues and conflicts and so on and so forth. It's not easy. That's why in 1 Timothy, Paul talked about fighting the good fight of faith. Because it's a fight. It's a battle. But we have the spirit. We have the ability to do this. And you see, what he's talking about here, he's reminding us basically of what Jesus said to the church in Revelation 2 and 3. He gave these promises, if we overcome, which means being faithful, loving and serving all the way to the end. It will be worth it. And he highlights the fact we should do good to everybody, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. Why? Because they're family, and families always are close to each other. Now, he summarizes the book in verses 11 through 18, where he says, See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. Um, well, that, again, is consistent with back what he, he said earlier uh, about, in chapter 4, about uh, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me, suggesting that he had a problem with his eyesight. He then goes on to say, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Um, and for those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast uh, in your flesh. But May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circ circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. Now, he goes back in verses 12 and 13 to talk about the Judaizers. And he's saying, number one, they're hypocrites. They don't even keep the, uh, the law themselves. 
I mean, that's why Jesus attacked the Pharisees. He says, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you lay all these burdens on people and then you don't keep them yourself. That is, hypocrisy is a mark of an unsaved person, if that characterizes their life. But he also points out that uh, they desire to have you circum... Uh, sorry, uh, it says that they compel you to be circumcised so that they won't be persecuted for the cross of Christ. In other words, uh, they were afraid of persecution by other Jews. They were primarily concerned with their own physical safety and well-being. And therefore, that's another reason why their whole theology went exactly contrary to what Christ is all about. When Christ told his disciples, don't fear those who can only kill the body but can't kill the soul. Remember to fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in heaven. Our focus should be towards God and others. Our physical well-being, even our life, is secondary. The Judaizers were showing just the opposite. Now, um, these verses are also again showing, he's concluding kind of the way he began, that Christianity is unlike every other religion in the world. Christianity is not a religion of outward ceremonies, but is inward and spiritual. Um, and that's why it all is based upon what Jesus did. And therefore, uh, that's why he says, if I am to boast in anything, may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, because it all comes down to what Jesus has done. And the practical implication of this is also stated in verse 14, where he says, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. When he says this, Paul is saying that the standards of the world, the values of the world, the way the world thinks are no longer the way he thinks, okay? Because Jesus didn't have the standards of the world. He had the standards of God. And once that gets inside of us deeply, we're going to start living out a new kind of life. And he proved the reality. He says he bears the brand marks of Christ. Well, we know in 2 Corinthians 11, he talks about how many times he was beaten for Christ, whipped, stoned, shipwrecked, imprisoned, and he bore those marks on his body. Because it didn't matter to him. He had the one thing he needed, Jesus Christ. And that's more important than anything else. Um, then he concludes in verse 15, he talks about the importance here uh, is a new creation. He had earlier talked about faith working through love. Now, faith working through love and a new creation are like two sides of the same coin. Faith working through love is what the world sees in us, our life. A new creation is what we are inside. And it's only because we are changed inside that our life changes on the outside. Um, and so, again, we are new. We're a new creation because we receive a new heart. We receive the mind of Christ. We receive the spirit of Christ. Um, we receive Christ's family. Um, we have a personal, intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ that we could not have otherwise, and the word is opened up to us. And he then ends by saying, those who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. The rule that he's talking about is faith and trust in Christ alone by which we walk with the Spirit. And we talks about... Uh, the Israel of God, that's the same thing as the new creation and those who walk by the rule. In other words, he's talking about the church. Jews and Gentile believers are united in one. We are the new, true, spiritual Israel of God. We, as Paul said earlier, are Abraham's true seed. The true Israel of God is not just Jews anymore. It's people from every tribe, tongue, and nation and in the entire world who have Jesus Christ inside of them. And he concludes in verse 18 by calling his readers brethren, your brothers, your sisters, 
were part of the same family, and praying for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He began this epistle with grace. The entire epistle has been about God's grace and the importance and necessity and centrality of grace, and thus he ends the same way. The beginning, middle, and end of our lives are based on and should reflect the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon each one of you. God bless you.